हेलो सो द टॉपिक ऑफ द डे हॉर्सनेस ऑफ वॉइस एंड हाउ टू अप्रोच अ पेशेंट विथ हॉर्सनेस दैट्स आवर टॉपिक ऑफ द डे So the topic of the day, hoarseness of voice and how to approach a patient with hoarseness. That's our topic of the day. So I am your ENT faculty, Dr. Sanjay Agrawal. So the topic and of the day, hoarseness of voice and how to approach a patient with hoarseness. That's our topic of the day. So I am your ENT faculty, Dr. Sanjay Agrawal. प्लीज एक्सक्यूज मी बिकॉज देर इज सम कंस्ट्रक्शन वर्क गोइंग ऑन This is the history. So this is the history. There is a 48-year-old with presented with hoarseness of voice for few days. now this is the history the only history the patient came and gave you is hoarseness of voice which is like change of voice so when the patient has change of voice what is the first thing that comes to your mind what are the causes of hoarseness of voice you know what are the causes that uh, conditions that can cause hoarseness of voice and we can divide the condition that causes hoarseness of voice into four broad conditions or causes that can cause hoarseness number 1 is inflammatory as you can see number 2 palsy of the vocal cord number 3 is uh, growth in the larynx and number 4 there seem to be some disturbance so i am just try to clarify and number 4 is voice disorders so inflammatory conditions like uh, usually uh, uh, acute infections and chronic infections now acute infections in children are usually epiglottitis you know or croup but in adult we could be tuberculosis leprosy uh maybe lupus things like that so a lot of these conditions which can affect the vocal cord and cause voices of voice vocal cord palsy is usually trauma to recurrent laryngeal nerve and when there is a trauma to recurrent laryngeal nerve it leads to what is called abductor palsy abductor palsy this can cause hoarseness of voice and trauma to superior laryngeal nerve and this can lead to what is called adductor palsy and this can also cause voice change or hoarseness of voice now causes of this palsy could be due to surgery or it idiopathic is very common where the cause is not known tumors tumors of esophagus tumors of larynx tumors of bronch 
uh, lung and all that then growth any growth in the vocal cord like uh, vocal cord nodule very common cause vocal cord poly papilloma of the vocal cord carcinoma of larynx and the neighboring area and there are many like laryngocele there is a very long list cyst in the vocal cord so it can be very very long list granuloma and voice disorders like puberphonia androphonia phonesthenia then rhinolalia rhinolalia are of two type aperta and clausa so both are capable of causing hoarseness or voice change so when the patient comes and tells you my voice is not clear i am not able to speak very nicely i have a hoarseness of voice then this chart should flash in your mind because it tells you all the important causes or common causes of vocal cord palsy and based on this you have to ask questions take a proper history based on this you have to do a proper examination and based on this you also have to uh, you know arrive at a conclusion a diagnosis and be able to treat that patient so obviously for infective diseases you have to usually they have fever in the patient pain and all that so you have to take history of that for all this and duration chronic or acute duration will tell you that then we have <clears throat> Uh, palsy, vocal cord palsy, again, you have to find out the causes of vocal cord palsy. So, you have to uh, ask about any trauma to the recurrent laryngeal nerve, any surgery done in the past, you know, these surgeries, and also tumors <coughs> has to be ruled out. Then, growths. In growths, usually there is no history as such, but yes, uh, this will become clear on examination could be nodule or polyp so nodule and polyp are seen in people who are professional misuses of voice like singers teachers so you have to take that history patient's professional history does the patient have to speak too much teach long duration sing long duration and things like that and laryngeal granuloma in this case there is a history of intubation it's called intubation granuloma so again you have to ask whether there was past history of intubation like there was a surgery done or the patient was admitted in ICU for which the patient was intubated and put on ventilation because these are the conditions that can cause granuloma in the larynx and cause voice change. So a lot of history here and the fourth category where you have the voice change are voice disorders like puberphonia, phonesthenia, ranulilia aperta, ranulilia clausa. So this again they become more evident on examination. So besides history which will take, the examination becomes very important to arrive at a conclusion so that you can make a final diagnosis. And treat. So, what are the other important? So, this was the first line. This is what the patient came and told you. And then you have to ask questions like any history of pain or fever because we know that in inflammatory disease, pain and fever is very, very important. Right. Then, history of in most cases where the patient also has a uh, Hoarseness of voice, the patient alongside also has dysphagia because uh, larynx and hypopharynx are next door. They are together. So when the larynx is affected, the hypopharynx often also gets affected and the patient is not able to swallow properly. So dysphagia means difficulty in swallowing. Sometimes there is odinophagia, painful swallowing. So you have to take the history of painful swallowing also. Then we have other history. dyspnea that is difficulty in breathing because again larynx also is for breathing so if you have any growth occupying space in the lesion or edema of the larynx inflammation they will obstruct the larynx and may cause dyspnea difficulty in breathing then any swelling or growth that the patient has noticed in the neck especially this area because most of the growth of the uh, neck they can be seen from outside also carcinomas lymph nodes things like that then we have Cardiovascular uh, system, you have to ask history of hypertension, any past history of angina, patient is 
has a, any known history of any cardiovascular insults, stroke, things like that. So, because they can also affect the blood supply and the nerve supply of the larynx and therefore can, can cause hoarseness of voice. So, there are also syndromes like Ortner syndrome. Ortner syndrome is cardiomegaly with vocal cord palsy. So, you have to ask about and if the patient has this kind of uh, problems, they will know because they will have taken treatment in the past. So, they will give you a history of any cardiovascular disease they have had in the past. Then neurological because at the end of the day, nerves like uh, the eighth nerve, vagus is supplying the larynx through recurrent laryngeal nerve and superior. So, any neural like multiple uh, sclerosis tends to involve a lot of cranial nerves and vagus can also get involved, laryngeal nerve also can get involved leading to vocal cord palsy. So, neurological defect can be there. So, you have to ask history about mm -hmm. that. Then we have any drug intake. Uh, usually, uh, patients on uh, thinner, thinning, blood thinning agents, they can have bleeding anywhere, also bleeding in the vocal cord and therefore can affect the vocal cord causing vocal cord palsy. So, drug intake history is very trauma, another cause. Trauma can cause damage the nerve that supplies the larynx. Trauma can cause trauma, direct trauma to the larynx. Trauma can cause trauma to the muscles that supplies the laryngeal muscle, uh, laryngeal, you know, vocal cord and all that cause movement, vibration. So, traumatic history is another important one. Family history, because uh, there are some diseases which are familiar like puberphonia, androphonia. These are diseases, conditions that can travel from family to, uh, you know, one generation to another generation. So, family history becomes important in these patients, especially if it is chronic kind of a hoarseness of voice and any past history. Because sometimes uh, patient can have recurrent vocal cord uh, palsy and that can cause hoarseness of voice. So these are the main things that you have to know in the history. Now let's assume, so based on which is positive history, which is negative, it can give you a lot of clue as to what is the problem in this patient. Let's assume that the only other complaint is uh, dysphagia. This is the only other complaint. Everything else is negative. There is no pain fever. There is no uh, dyspnea. There is no swelling or growth. There is no cardiovascular problem. No neurological problem. No drug intake. Nothing. No past history. No family. Everything is normal. Only dysphagia. So we have two complaints now: dysphagia and hoarseness of voice. Now these two together doesn't give us much information. Only hoarseness and hoarseness with hoarseness with dysphagia is almost you know, same thing, there is no much addition because what it tells us is that the same pathway has a problem. Because as I said in the beginning also, the breathing pathway, the voice pathway and the swallowing pathway is very common. They are very close by. So if you have disease in that area, it is very commonly going to cause dysphagia as well as hoarseness. However, I will tell you one thing that suppose when I draw the face like this, Let's say, okay, now this is the pharynx. These are the three parts nasopharynx, oropharynx, laryngopharynx. Let's say this is larynx. And we all know larynx is divided into three parts. If I draw two lines, let's say larynx has three parts supraglottis, glottis, and subglottis. So if you have problem in the glottis, which is the middle part, and subglottis, which is the inner part, these two area diseases, they will not cause no dysphagia usually. So long as the disease is confined to the larynx only. Of course, if the disease from here goes behind, if it spreads to the hypopharynx, this area is hypopharynx. So if the disease spreads to the hypopharynx, then of course dysphagia can happen. But if the disease is confined only to the glottis and the subglottis of the larynx, inflammation, simple growth, benign growth, edema, all this they will not cause dysphagia. Whereas a supraglottic, this area is supraglottis, let's say, a supraglottic growth, this is supraglottic, diseases, growth, inflammation, they can cause dysphagia also. Because the food which is going to travel from the oral cavity tends to go from here like this. So, if you have a problem in this area, the food pa passes also gets affected, the epiglottis and all that. So, one thing it tells us that if you have hoarseness only without dysphagia, then perhaps the disease is either glottis or subglottis 
without spreading to the hypopharynx and without involving the supraglottis area. But if the patient has dysphagia, like in this case, then either the disease is in the supraglottis or the hypopharynx has also been affected. That's why the patient has a difficulty in swallowing. So this is one information that this particular additional uh, symptom that dysphagia gives us. Now, when you have a disease in the oropharynx and oral cavity, say you have a disease in this area, oral cavity and oropharynx, then again they will cause dysphagia like tonsillitis, quincy. But these conditions of quincy and tonsillitis, they will cause dysphagia but no hoarseness. Because hoarseness is specifically when larynx is involved. And if your oropharynx or oral cavity is involved, it may cause dysphagia but no hoarseness of voice. So I'm sure you understand that only dysphagia without hoarseness means maybe these areas are involved or maybe hypopharynx is involved. Only hoarseness without dysphagia, only glottis and subglottis are involved, these two areas. But if both are there, then either it is supraglottis or hypopharynx also involved along with larynx. So in this patient, it has to be hypopharynx or supraglottic of the larynx is involved. That's why there is dysphagia as well as hoarseness of voice. So this one information we get. So this is how you, you know, this is just one additional symptoms tells you so much if you know this physiology and anatomy. So that's why knowing anatomy and physiology becomes so important. And this is the whole crux of the next, uh, next exam, which is going to be conducted uh, since uh, 2022. So for that, this kind of information is very, very important. If you know this kind of things, then if they give you a clinical based question, and just one additional symptom or one less symptom, they give you so much of information. But for all this to decipher, you have to have this basic knowledge. So now we know that hoarseness and dysphagia means either larynx is involved, obviously hoarseness, and supraglottis or hypopharynx, one of the two is definitely involved. That's why there is dysphagia also. And this we can confirm with examination. So clearly, the next will be systemic examination, we always do this and then we have to do a proper head and neck examination because it is hoarseness and dysphagia, this area of the body is involved. So head and neck external examination then, then you have to do inside oral, oral cavity and oropharyngeal examination and now comes the most important examination which is laryngoscopy, laryngeal examination, larynx and hypopharynx and we all know that laryngoscopies are direct laryngoscopy, indirect laryngoscopy, fiber optic laryngoscopy, endoscopy. So whatever is required depends on how you look at it, what is you are comfortable with, you have to do that. And sometimes you may have to take biopsy if there is a growth, especially if you see any growth, any swelling, you may have to take biopsy for histopathological examination. Then scans are very commonly done, CT scan, MRI. If you suspect a malignancy, you may also advise for PET scan, you know. So various, various types of scans can be advice then if you feel that the deeper part of the airway may be involved like in laryngeal papilloma laryngeal papilloma is called multiple papilloma so along with the larynx papillomas may be seen in the bronchus also and therefore sometimes bronchoscopy may be required so these are depends on what you are suspecting then when the nerves are involved i told you recurrent laryngeal nerve superior laryngeal nerve the nerve stimulation test different type electroneuronography for instance may be required. Then muscle myelography may be required to see whether the muscles of the larynx because ultimately the muscles vibrate and that produces voice. So if the muscles are not vibrating properly, the larynx cannot or vocal cord cannot vibrate and the voice will be not be good. There will be hoarseness of voice. So myelography may be required. So these are and routine tests like all the blood test counts, things like that may be required. Routine test is always done. <coughs> X-rays of the chest, ECG and all that. So this is how you have to go. In all this, normally when there is a hoarseness of voice and dysphagia, the most important investigation is laryngoscopy because by doing laryngoscopy, you can actually see the larynx and if there is any problem, if there is vocal cord palsy, you can see that. If there is some growth, nodule, poly, papilloma, carcinoma, you can see that. If there is inflammation, you can see that. In tuberculosis, there are findings like cobblestone, uh, turban epiglottis, mouse nibble. You can actually see on laryngoscopy. 
Now we start with indirect laryngoscopy where you take a mirror, hit the mirror and put it into the mouth and see the reflected image of the larynx on that mirror. This is the first thing we do because uh, this is very simple OPD procedure but it has a lot of limitations. So fiber optic laryngoscopy, FOL stands for fiber optic laryngoscopy is also an OPD procedure. Uh, this is better. This gives you more information. This can be tolerated easily by the patient, can be done in OPD without anesthesia. And if you require to take biopsy, you can take biopsy also. In indirect laryngoscopy, you cannot take biopsy. In this, you can take biopsy also. And if both are not sufficient, you feel you have not got evident, uh, sufficient information or you have not been able to see properly or cannot take a biopsy properly, then you can also do direct laryngoscopy. Direct laryngoscopy may be required where the advantage of direct laryngoscopy is that you can see all the part of the larynx properly and you can take a proper biopsy for histopathological examination. But this is only when you, sus when you see some growth, when you suspect some kind of tumor, then only we do this. Otherwise, in most cases, if there is a palsy, for instance, you don't have to do vocal cord palsy. Or there is a voice disorder, puberphonia, rhinolalia, aparta and all that, you may not have to do this. Scan is the second most important investigation. This, these two together gives you the max, not this one, this one. Laryngoscopy and scan together gives you the maximum information in most of these patients. Most likely with these two things, laryngoscopy and scan, CT scan or MRI or PET, PET scan or maybe ultrasound also, will give you the maximum possible information. By now, you will have made diagnosis in most cases. In rare cases, you might have to do bronchoscopy like I gave you an example, laryngeal papilloma, which could be multiple papilloma or if there is a foreign body, you know, in the airway, you may have to do bronchoscopy and when you suspect a nerve problem or muscle problem, you may have to go for this too and routine test you should always get done because it, it can sometimes surprise you with some information which you are not suspecting. So, if it is inflammatory, blood counts will be raised, you know, things like if the patient is diabetic, of course, sugar will be high patient could be having hypothyroidism because hypothyroidism is another very important cause that's why systemic examination becomes important because hypothyroidism is a very important cause of uh, hoarseness of voice so you have to rule out that hormonal causes so all that you can uh, only uh, know if you do uh, blood routine examination also so by all likelihood as i said that uh, by now the patient you will have made diagnosis so we are not going in a for a particular diagnosis but one thing from the history we have realized that there is something that is involving the larynx along with the larynx either the supraglottis of the larynx because the, there is horse, uh, dysphagia or the disease has spread to the hypopharynx behind the larynx which is causing dysphagia. <clears throat> so either these are inflammatory diseases or these are usually growths. When you have involvement of the larynx, supraglottis or hypopharynx, there are two kinds of diseases that can spread to this wide area. Either they are inflammatory disease, any infections, acute or chronic, or simple edema, angioneuritic edema, for instance, can do this, or growths, tumors can spread, you know, we know this. So, most likely, one of the two will be there with this history. If there is no dysphagia, only hoarseness of voice, then it is an open field. It could be just any of the chart that I gave you. It could be anything, any of those, all those things. So, really, will depend. So, we are not going to take one diagnosis we are just uh, talking about how to approach when the patient comes with hoarseness of voice and once you have established the diagnosis then of course you have to treat the patient now in the treatment of laryngeal uh, uh, diseases the treatment will depend on what is the diagnosis final diagnosis now let's take one by one if there are inflammatory disease like uh, epiglottitis or croup or tuberculosis then usually you have to give antibiotics or you can say medicinal treatment they are all medicinal treatment along with antibiotics symptomatic maybe steroids are very commonly used if this vocal cord palsy then you have to find the cause of the palsy and treat the cause. So, first, if there is a tumor, you have to treat the tumor. 
but very often there is no cause you know like idiopathic so you cannot do it. in such cases you may have to do surgeries so surgeries may be required for hoarseness of voice in vocal cord palsy the two important surgeries either we do type 1 thyroplasty or we, we have to inject injections of teflon or collagen so one of the two surgeries are usually required when there is a hoarseness of voice due to vocal cord paralysis once you have treated the cause or if the cause is not found then for growths like nodule or polyp or papilloma you know or carcinoma now in most growths granuloma and things like that surgery is very important treatment micro laryngoscopic surgery or micro laryngeal surgery is a very very important part of the treatment nowadays we have started doing debridement also micro debridement in lot of surgeries in lot of growth micro debridement and co2 laser mainly in the larynx we use co2 laser so these are kind of surgeries and a new therapy called photodynamic therapy has also been tried in many growths of the larynx so it really depends on a what is the growth and b what facility of surgery you have so for instance photodynamic therapy is a very new kind of therapy and like my hospital does not have this so i can't offer this treatment although i may find i may feel that photodynamic is the best option for this patient but i don't have this facility so i can't offer it's a very new kind of therapy right so this is how you go for growth and if you have what was the last thing uh, growth and voice disorders if there is voice disorder then each voice disorder has its own kind of treatment in like pure phonia androphonia there is only counseling you only do counseling or voice therapy you know voice therapy or speech therapy as it's called which is very commonly used in vocal otherwise also and then depending on specific type of voice disorder you may have to uh, treat the patient accordingly so this in a nutshell is how you approach a patient of hoarseness of voice so once again when the patient comes and gives you only history of hoarseness then two things matter here the age and the profession if the age is a child, child with hoarseness, then two things come to mind. Laryngeal papilloma, which is called juvenile papilloma, and vocal cord palsy. Sometimes vocal cord nodule also. So nodule, palsy, and papilloma comes to the mind if he is a child. Adult could have anything. There is no limit. Then profession. The second thing is profession. If the patient's profession is such, the patient has to speak a lot, like teacher, singer, hawker, you know people in the market shouting and selling stuff hawkers in these people misuse of voice disorders like vocal cord nodule vocal cord polyps are very common and if you don't have this history it's adult and there is no is a office goer you know blue colored job and begins to have, have hoarseness of voice it could be anything there is really, the field is wide open so in such patients the history further history becomes very important associated with hoarseness dysphagia and dyspnea are very common so these are the first two things you ask and for inflammatory is pain fever then professional history like i said for speeches teachers and singers and then is there any swelling is there any cardiovascular disease is there neurological disease diabetes and all that is there trauma any drug intake family history past history all that we have to talk about right and then the third part is the examination one is a systemic examination local head and neck examination oral cavity oropharynx examination but the most important is the laryngoscopic examination which could be either indirect or direct or fiber optic this will give you the maximum info part of uh, uh, amount of information in patient with hoarseness of voice so you can see inflammation you could see vocal cord palsy you could see growth if there is one so and if there is a growth in direct laryngoscopy especially you can also take biopsy for a histopathological examination and that will tell you what the growth is about is it benign or malignant if it's malignant what type of malignancy you know all the information will give you 
and the second most important invest, uh, investigation that will give you a lot of information is the scan ct scan can be done mri in larynx both are equally important ct scan and mri but if you are suspecting uh, uh, carcinoma then you can also and metastatic carcinoma especially then you might have to go for pet scan pet scan also in the thyroid growth or cystic growth of the neck you may you may go for simple ultrasound of the neck which can be done so all this will give you a lot of information and then specific types of like if they if you suspect a neurological defect you can go for nerve stimulation test like electroneuronography if you see there is a muscle problem then you can go for myelography and routine investigations has to be done in all cases diabetes thyroid you know level and uh, counts blood counts you look for blood counts and all that so they, they give you a lot of information and most probably by doing all these things especially history laryngoscopy scan these three together will most probably uh, lead to the diagnosis confirmed diagnosis and then treatment of the patient will depend on the diagnosis which is always the case inflammatory disease you have to give medicinal treatment by, by and large in very severe cases where there is dyspnea also you may have to do tracheostomy then if vocal cord palsy is there then you need to find the cause of the palsy and treat the palsy sometimes despite treating the palsy the voice change remains hoarseness remains in those cases you might have to do surgery on the vocal cord and i told you two surgery on the vocal cord for vocal cord palsy to improve the voice is either thyroplasty type 1 which is called medialization of the vocal cord or injection of taflon and collagen can be done then <clears throat> growths now growth really there is a very long list of growths that can cause voice change hoarseness of voice right now simple growths like nodule to carcinoma can happen nodule poly papilloma cyst granuloma carcinoma laryngocele Uh, ring is edema anything could be there so really you have to diagnose and treat on the merit of the diagnosis but in growth most of the growths will require some form of surgery some form of surgical management and the surgery usually is called micro laryngeal surgery because we have to use microscope to do the surgery on the larynx sometimes nowadays we are doing a lot of laser surgeries we are doing a lot of micro debridement newer things like cryotherapy or uh, photodynamic therapy things like that are gaining more popularity as the time passes so you have to know about these therapies because they ask you questions on this and in some cases they are the best options like laryngeal papilloma photodynamic therapy is thought to be very very good option compared to all other options now so really you have to know all these things and if there is a voice disorder puerophonia most of the voice disorder the puerophonia androphonia laryngolalia parta laryngoclosa phonesthenia they require speech therapy voice therapy as the main form of treatment and in some cases you may have to do additional like botox botox injections maybe surgery like thyroplasty type 3 type 4 may be required in some few cases so this is how you approach a patient of hoarseness of voice hoarseness in the throat is the most important uh, symptom in the ear like hearing loss is the most important symptom in the nose nasal blockage nasal discharge are the main symptoms in the throat hoarseness is the most important symptom that's why i took hoarseness as a main topic of the day so this will complete today's topic and before i leave you i must tell you about this iconic subscription and this marathon badge which is mcq based for 2021 neat pg examination so i hope that you have joined this already and you are making taking the best benefit out of all this if not please join this so with this i'll take your leave thank you for joining wish you all the best take a very good care